Hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing? My name is Mike Simron with the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame. How are you guys? Boy, this is going to be a fantastic, fantastic fun night. I'm so excited. I've been thinking about it all week. Um, we're going to talk about the legendary club in Lincoln, Nebraska, called the Drumstick. Uh, the legendary Drumstick. I'm sure most of you have heard about it or perhaps heard whispers or some stories or craziness that happened at that place. It was located uh, roughly around 48th and between R and S, right where the McDonald's is, if you are if you can think about that corner or that, that strip, I guess. And that's where the, the club uh, used to be. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's filled with unbelievable amounts of history, uh, Nebraska rock and roll history. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get into that in a little bit, but I just wanna say welcome and much love to you for tuning in. Please share this uh, and get, let's get some organic shares because as you know, the more people that like it, the more people that comment and uh, share it, the more love the actual video stream gets. So uh, please also, I encourage you to share your memories if you have them. Um, uh, also tell us stories, uh, you know, pipe in on the comments. We're going to be very uh, attentive to those comments this evening and we're going to uh, share back as soon as we can and talk talk to you about that. We got a few friends joining us uh, later to talk about this wonderful place, including some of the original family members that that uh, ran it. So um, first off, I want to talk about the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame. This is a 501c3 that my father, Mike Simrad Sr., and I started. And, um, and here's the website, and you can check that out. It is at nebraskaperformingarts.com. And uh, like I said, this is a nonprofit. We're going to host all kinds of cool events like this um, until, you know, we can no longer do so. So pay attention. We're going to be in inducting some really cool people, some really cool places. And um, uh, we, we have already inducted a few. So uh, you can check the website out. Uh, we had some uh, awesome events planned before the COVID freakout. And so we're going to try to get to those uh at some point, we're going to uh, induct the famous John Walker, Dr. John Walker, who's a folk hero in Nebraska history. Sour Mash, who's incredible. Uh, John John Wagon Master from KZUM. Many of you know him. And uh, Dave Morris, Dave Fowler, Fowler, and Peter Blakesley were set to be inducted April 11th, but that didn't happen. So we're going to figure out a way we can do that still. So uh, we got a ton of stuff planned. And remember, you can make your donations tonight to uh, our PayPal account. Um, and so we can keep doing these kinds of things. It's not uh, a free venture. It does cost money to do these kinds of things and it takes time to put all of it together. So if you could donate uh, via PayPal to uh, at N-E-H-O-F or info at NebraskaPerformingArts.com or through Venmo at Nebraska Arts, that would be awesome. And like I said, uh, even if you got a few bucks, a little bit helps a lot. And we can organize this types of type of thing uh, for the future, which we love to do. So, um, like I said, lots of great stuff uh, happening. So tune in uh, as much as you can and share what you uh, share what you can as well, gentlemen. Um, again, my name is Mike Simrod, Mike Simrod Jr. Of course, my father, Mike Simrod Sr., was uh, um, in one of the very first rock bands in Nebraska. So he had a, a very musical family. I, I'm lucky enough to come from. And uh, yeah, so uh, he was there from the beginning. I think early 1964 was one of the very first bands in Nebraska and went on to play with a band called The Smoke Ring, who was on American Bandstand like 68, 69. So uh, some wonderful history there. So I just love sharing the history of Nebraska music. It's one of my passions. Um, it always will be. I grew, I grew up around my dad, who's kind of an encyclopedia of rock and roll history. And, um, and I've learned a lot from him. And along with that, um, he's given me a lot of his passion and uh, his obsession for collecting things uh, as well. So <laughs> uh, many of those things being Nebraska uh, iconic pieces of uh, history. So uh, anyway, let's get to the show, folks. And like I said, tune in. Looks like we got some comments coming in already. So awesome. Pinky's tuning in. So that's great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to invite my first guest on. And we're going to start talking about this great, great thing called the drumstick. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Kathy Lohmeyer. Hello, Kathy Lohmeyer. Howdy. 
<laughs> there you are. I like your shirt. That's great. Remember the drumstick. That is a fantastic logo for a fantastic place. Now, uh, yeah. So welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? Thank you. I'm great. Good. It's a great day. Good. Awesome. Once Excited again. to be here. Thank you so much yep. for letting us talk to you yeah. tonight. That's my pleasure. Um, you and I have been chatting about this for a long time, and it's just awesome to finally see some stuff come to fruition. And uh, you're doing an incredible job. Uh, for the folks out there, tell them about what you were, your role is, not wow. only with the family, but but with the project. So, Well, the whole project is to do a documentary about Remember the, dr the Drumstick, because the place is gone and so much of what it was all about is gone. And I, I think there's a lot of people in Lincoln that don't know anything about it. Absolutely. So I know that, that's that true. was the goal was just, you know, to capture some stories, preserve these stories, make sure that there's something that says this thing happened. It really happened in Lincoln, Nebraska. But I'm the I'm one of the children of the my of the drumstick, if you will. My parents ran owned the place, ran the place, and all of us, all eight children worked in the drumstick at some stage. Oh my and, gosh. Yeah, and I'm number seven out of the eight. Okay, so so, so you're one of the you're one of the younger bunch, right? Yes, I and am. You and you look and, a lot like you look a lot like uh, Diane, who who I worked for in college at uh, high, <laughs> high Nooners. Yeah, she yeah, was my yeah. boss. Yeah, she was my boss. well, she, we are sisters, so it's amazing. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it makes sense that we look like each other. I I got you guys confused at one point. I was like, oh my gosh, it happens. It happens yeah. a lot. So, she was the so one what? who was really in the drumstick. She ran it. Show, oh, she ran but, it. Okay. Yeah, she and Tim were the ones that ran it. That's why a lot of people will remember her. And she yeah. had folks that would come into the, she had high nooners, that sandwich place on O Street. Oh, and yeah. people would come in and say, Diane, we remember you from the drumstick. So. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, she was a great boss. She was one of my very first bosses in college. I worked there while I worked at Knickerbockers, which a lot of people yeah. remember. I did sound at Knickerbockers while I slung sandwiches at high nooners. So uh, tell us what year, yeah, what year I mean, was... What year did uh, the, the, the chicken joint start? Tell us about well, what year was that. I'll just give you like a really short version of how this whole thing got started. Awesome. The short version is that my dad started, I mean, he took over the drumstick in like 1967 and it was a chicken shack all that time. I mean, breakfasts, pancakes, hamburgers, French fries and fried chicken that, you know, it was just a mom and pop restaurant. And in 1978, um, I got married for the first time and the wedding reception was held there and we okay. booked little Jimmy Valentine and the heart murmurs for the wedding oh, reception. Well, lucky you, gee whiz. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And that just turned out to be a really, really fun night. Wow. And wow. everybody remembered it. And in a, in two, within two months, a tragedy happened to our family and that was our mother was killed in a car accident at 56 and O Street. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I didn't know that. Yeah, most people don't know that. And that's not even going to be in the documentary. But I want people oh. to understand that it was that tragedy that really made the drumstick happen as far as a music venue. Whoa. Because, you know, things just went into complete chaos. We were trying to make the business run, we were trying to make a little more money. You know, the breakfast trade, the lunch trade was dipping down a little bit because franchises in 1978 were becoming very popular and fast food joints. So it was eaten into our food business. Oh, wow. So we oh, said, wow. well, geez, maybe we'll just start booking a few bands. We had a lot of fun at the wedding reception. <laughs> yeah. And that's basically how it got started. So in, in 1967, you said, is when it. That was the chicken restaurant in 1978 yeah. is when the wedding reception was. And that's right. when the music right. took off. But was the, in 67, was it originally called the drumstick? Always called the drumstick. Always called the drum. Okay. I wanted to make sure. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And most, wow. there's a lot of people in Lincoln that still remember the drumstick as just the restaurant. Wow. It and that's why like this logo, I don't know if you can see the logo well enough. But it's the cute. top part's a guitar, and the bottom part is a chicken leg. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> I love it. I love, I love, love, love it. And now but, you guys I mean, kind of have a 
there's like a family <laughs> branch off with, with with Lee's chicken still. There's kind of a, a the, the the branch off happens with that as well. Yes, uh, chicken yeah. chicken is in our blood. It's it's in your blood. <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. Yeah, my uh, nephew. That's my nephew that works at Lee's. He married uh, one of the Wilcoxon daughters. Yes, yes, yes. So. They're my neighbor. They live two houses down. So fantastic. That's incredible. The chicken is in your blood. So 1967, 1978 happens and the family is just kind of, kind of not scrambling, but just kind of in limbo, kind of figuring out things. It was, it was, like I said, I got married in 1978, August, 1978. And my mother was dead August, or October 1st, 1978. Wow. Oh my God. And it was just, I mean, she was our, our rudder yeah. to the family. And yeah. so it threw everything into chaos. My yeah. dad was kind of in shock and we were all just drifting. And basically there, we were all trying to help manage the drumstick as a restaurant, trying to keep it going. And like I said, it just, that was the time of year when, you know, Burger King was really becoming popular and, McDonald's and, you know, Village Inn, all those new restaurants were kind of eaten into our lunch trade. And we were just trying to think of a way to make more money. And we thought, what the heck? Let's get a liquor license. We had a beer and wine license first. And we booked Eddie and the Clones. <laughs> <laughs> that was the very first band we booked. That was the first official Thursday. booking. Yeah, That official. was the official booking. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. incredible. And it just... And because it was a big room, and you'll you'll hear this in the documentary, it was a big room, and you could put a lot of people in there, yeah. and the floor was just linoleum, so we had a decent dance floor too, and yeah. you know we built a, a makeshift stage and had stuff get plugged into the electrical sockets, and it had oh just like the picture in the background there. It yeah. had big, huge plate glass windows across the front with curtains, and those never came down. They were always plate glass windows while people played in front of them. Wow. That, so um, somebody once told me that uh, it was like food all night. It Was was it a 24-7? I think you closed for like two hours maybe? Yeah. So it was like open till like four or five in the morning for, for a greasy spoon type late night eating. But then you'd close at like four or five in the morning and then open up for the third shifters at six or seven. Yeah. Is that right? That's it. Yeah. So you literally. I mean, for, a while, for a while, it was a pure 24 hour restaurant. But then it just got to the point where we needed some time to close it down to clean it up. So it would close about three or four in the morning and then come back open again at six. Wow. So, so you literally had to clean up a bunch of like rock and roll crap in order to start serving food again, right? Basically. I, yeah, yeah. Just, that's unbelievable. And I used to work at Knickerbockers, so I know how that quote unquote crap accumulates on the floors. Yeah. It was, I mean, I was the one that mopped and cleaned up. So this is yeah. the picture of the original uh, yeah. pl place. That's right it. There. That's now, all it was. Yep. And, and in that location now is a McDonald's, which is a, kind of a sad story, but uh, but that's <laughs> like, like you said, it is what it is. Change Time marches up. on. Yeah. And it, but yeah, know, I mean, there and and a lot of people don't understand this, but it started out basically just booking, you know, local bands, mm -hmm. local bands like Charlie Burton and his many variations. And um, the Rip Chords was another band that was really popular and played there a lot. And uh, gosh, I can't even think of all of them right now, yeah. right off the top of my head. But then something happened and this something was called Joan Jett. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Joan Jett. I would imagine yeah. that that's, a, that's kind of a big something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we were booking local bands and uh, like Blue Rhythm Band, all these folks. And we would pack the place on many a night. We'd pack the place and it would be a lot of fun. People would dance, dance, dance like mad. But then, we got into the the world that said, hey, this is a we can put a lot of people in here. Maybe we could get a bigger act because we can take more money in at the door to cover their of costs. Of course. Yeah. And yeah. we had some connections to the booking agent that had Joan Jett. And you'll hear this story 
in the documentary from told by Eric Amble, who's oh, cool. um, he was the um, lead guitarist for Joan Jett at the time. So yeah, we, we booked Joan Jett and, and that I think really changed things for the drumstick. Then that, that's when it started to go more towards the music than the restaurant. So, so did the, fa- the that family, that was basically 1981. Okay, 1981. So the family kind of realized, hey, this is a legitimate money source, I would imagine. Well, it definitely br- brought a lot of money in that day. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. In any music club, it's kind of up and down, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so but that was point, where Tim came in. Tim came, my brother Tim was really the brains behind all of this. Gotcha. He was, uh, he was the man with the personality and the interest in music and... He, he was the one who took it where it went. Unbelievable. Well, I've, I've heard so many great things. I was talking to Mr. Dave Robel from, uh, you know, uh, Charlie Burton's band. And he also played, he played with rock therapy, the cutouts and the hiccups. And he also now currently plays with shit hook and, and a few other bands. But I was talking to him today and he said that, uh, you know, your, your brother Tim was just an incredibly funny character. And, um, you know, and, and I've heard that from a lot of people. He sounds like a super fun guy. You'll hear it a lot in the documentary. Yeah, yeah. Because that's really what the, the, that's what this is all about. Just trying to tell this very American, you know, grassroots story about a family running a business and it goes in a direction no one expected. And, you know, there is magic there and there is, there are stars in the making in this little chicken shack turned rock club. <laughs> so um, a friend of mine was telling me that he was the guy that went to go pick up a little band from Georgia called R-E- REM. Um, and he went to go pick them up at the airport. And uh, that, that was that the band was called REM. So they kind of turned out to be pretty popular. Uh-huh. Hey, so, um, Mike, can you see Sharonda yet? I can. Should we invite her in? Yeah, let's get her in. Uh, let's see. I see a. Let, let's see. I see this screen. I'm not sure what that means. It looks like her webcam's not working properly, but I do see her. Um, but t- let her know her webcam's not on. But I'll invite her back in here in a second. Sharonda is the associate producer of the film, so we're trying to get her in. But her webcam is not working properly. But so. Um, I'm yeah. just sending her a text right now. Okay, yeah, go ahead. And I'll I'll just kind of poke through pictures here. It looks like this is a this is a painting of your brother. That's pretty cool. Jim yeah. Jacoby did, did a bunch of artwork. He also did the artwork behind me, if if you can see that, folks. He did an yeah. awesome painting. Oh, here she is. Here's Sharonda. Let's see if she can we can Yay. Get There she Yay. is. Can you hear us? Yeah. Hi, hear you. Hi. 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 <laughs> Welcome, Sharonda. Nice to meet you. It's My nice name's Mike. To meet you as well. Yeah. Sharonda oh. is our associate producer on the documentary. Fantastic. And uh, this documentary would not exist if it weren't for her. I'll be real honest. I mean, mm-hmm. I got the thing started, but she is the one who, you know, heard the story, thought it had value, and helped me through all the steps that it takes to make a motion picture. Yeah. Well, that that's fantastic. I, I appreciate your work, Sharonda, on something that hopefully Nebraskans will cherish and and they will keep watching and watching. And like like Kathy said, I mean, this is really what the mission of the Hall of Fame is, is to honor and don't forget all these great things that happened before us. And like you said, I know for a fact there's people that have no idea uh, about these clubs that you know existed and completely rocked so many uh, adolescent folks back in the day um and uh you know i i keep hearing stories about it over and over i w- i personally did not experience it but i feel like i've now understood it from so many people sharing their stories so sharonda tell mike how how i mean i had to pitch this to sharonda tell tell mike that story of how you felt when we were telling you about this to see if you even wanted to get involved Well, um, I originally um, got involved about January 2019 
I was recommended to Kathy um, by the Nebraska Independent Film Projects, which is cool. um, a film yeah. group based out of Lincoln. And um, I'm not sure how um, she was recommended to me, but basically I was told by the president of, of that group, uh, Chad Hofschild, like, hey, I think you should talk to um, these people with the music documentary. That seems like it's up your alley. Cool. So um, I met with Kathy and with John, and they basically were was telling me about this era of music I absolutely have no knowledge of myself um, being 35 years old. <laughs> um, I have absolutely no knowledge of it. Um, I'm not from Nebraska. And um, I am just interested in stories. Sure. And I heard when I heard about the drumstick and I heard about her brother and I heard about how the drumstick is personified a little bit with her brother and how so many people remember the drumstick through her brother. Um, it, it just spoke to me as a story that it needs to be told. And hopefully with the documentary, we are doing um, native Lincoln people justice and how we're telling this story. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Well, you're in it for the right reasons, which is beautiful. That's great. Um, well, the story of him and the story of the family and how something can just sort of transpire and manifest from a chicken place is just, you know, and it became an iconic that rock club that, that uh, band members from Joan Jett and REM are still talking about. Uh, L. Kent Walgamont was saying that he ran into uh, the bass player of REM at South by Southwest. And and he was say, just talking about how cool the place was. And so many memories are still shared after all these years. That's I have awesome. a story about um, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh, wow. When they came to Lincoln in January, I think, I think it was 2018 or 2019. I can't remember. Okay. Anyway, you know, I have tried my best to reach out to all these bands that played there. And I'm telling you, it's a stellar list. I mean, we've got Red Hot Chili Peppers, Joan Jett, R.E.M., Black Flag, uh, Descendants, Violent Femmes. A lot of bands have passed through Lincoln. And every time a band that passes through Lincoln that I I know was there, I reach out to them to try to get them to talk to me or do an interview or something for the for the documentary. But Red Hot Chili Peppers, of course, played the Pinnacle Bank Arena and couldn't get in through the gatekeepers at all. But halfway through the show, they did a shout out for the drumstick. Oh, man. Off the Pinnacle Bank stage. And I wish to God I could have gotten footage of that because they were like, we've been here to Lincoln. We remember the drumstick. That was that was the place we played first. Yeah, Red wow. Hot Chili Peppers from L.A. played the little old drumstick in the 1980s before they became famous. Yeah, it's amazing. That is, and I think I think that's part of it. Don't you agree, Sharana? That's kind of part of the mystery or the mystique of this thing, is that these were bands that were playing the alt rock scene in the 80s, and then several of them went on to become just superstars. Uh, yep. Yeah, it was a very strange uh, time in music where um, they were still doing the touring thing. Like, yes, bands tour today, but it's a different type of touring. So a lot of people in the documentary talked about how Lincoln, Nebraska just happens to be in the smack dab middle of the country on two major routes. So um, they were able to, Lincoln was able to just get pretty much any band that was going from one way to the other. Um, and it just was a kind of a perfect storm of getting these acts that were going to be famous or huge later on, like Red Hot Chili Peppers, like R.E.M., like Joan Jett. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's incredible because it can't really be repeated now. No, no. I mean, this whole world of how music is made and how it's distributed and introduced to the public. I mean, it's all electronic now, isn't it? Digitized. What do you think, Mike? Well, I think bands still tour and they still, the ones that are extremely uh, at it and willing to put in the hours to tour, uh, that still works. And people that hit the same, uh, 
you know, they pound the same regional areas over and over again, like the chili peppers did, like they'll hit, you know, keep hitting a certain city, um, two or three times to build a crowd. I mean, that still happens. That stuff happens, but you're right. I mean, predominantly a lot of people's Avenue, especially now during a pandemic, you know, this is like <laughs> the, uh, the ideal Avenue is to come at people through streaming services and, um, and yeah, online shows. I mean, this is, it's a new era. You're right. It's different, but, but the old pound in the pound in the pavement hitting the road kind of thing still does exist. You know, it still, it still works for many bands, you know, but you're not going to see Beyonce for two dollars at a club. Let's just be yeah. honest. Uh, <laughs> you know, Probably no. never was going to see Beyonce at no. a club for two dollars. <laughs> no, because bands like Beyonce and these kind of huge bands, they usually have, uh, they usually get into the industry with a boom. You know, like there, there's a lot of make a band happening happening nowadays. And frankly, I was, you know, there's a band called Maroon 5, that producer approached me in Chicago about becoming a second version of a make a band. And it was kind of a band that was made in a lab. I'm not saying that Maroon 5 was, but there was a definite sense of putting together a second version in a warehouse. And I was a part of that. And it was definitely strange. It's like, well, we don't even have to tour. We'll just start opening up for huge bands right away. And that, and you see that more and more, it becomes a producer's playground as opposed mm. to as opposed to like a DIY band like the descendants who just tour like crazy you know yeah, like back yeah. in, and 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 venues like the drumstick would take them in wholeheartedly probably feed them some chicken and get them up on stage and that's what it was about. oh yeah oh yeah that was so. what well, wasn't that one of the things in the documentary Sharana that the the people we interviewed the band members that we interviewed they all said oh yeah the, the the contract always included one free meal at the drumstick <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they were really looking forward to that chicken. Uh, I think it, it was kind of hilarious because they probably had, you know, the pay or whatever. That could be negotiable, but the chicken wasn't. The chicken. <laughs> That's great. That is awesome. That is but awesome. yeah, I mean, let's be honest. The, the odds of the drumstick happening again right now, or even if it wasn't the coronavirus happening, it's slim to none. I mean... The market's different. The audiences are different. It's just hard to tell. But the point of the whole documentary was to let people know that, yeah, magic can happen when you least expect it. Mm -hmm. And true, true. And sometimes all it takes is a big room with electricity to make it happen. Yes. Well, and one thing we should talk about is that, which I've noticed, uh, you know, I mean, my dad talks about stories my friends who are older talk about stories about how the live music scene was so healthy and people did they went out and they drank and had fun and drove home and then all of a sudden one day the cops got smart and said no moss we're not doing that anymore and the drinking age went up to 21 right and then they started mm -hmm. giving duis out like crazy so you're right i think that i think that having something like the drumstick and that era of live music and people going and, and having just letting everything hang out. I mean, that was like, that was that I hear about that stuff and it makes me jealous. I'm like, wow, I bet that was awesome. You know, as a musician. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, 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 there's so many dimensions to the story. And mm -hmm. that was something Sharonda and I worked on and Sharonda really helped guide me to say, there are a lot of pieces to this story, but we have to tell a story mm -hmm. in this documentary. Yeah. So trying to figure out what the story, what was the story and how broad it was and how much we can put into this storyline, that took a lot of work. And we hope, we hope we, we nailed it. I think we nailed it. So we have like a bunch of people asking about when can they see it? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I'll let you handle that, Rock Sharonda. Well, um, as far as the stage goes, we are actually almost finished. Okay. So hopefully we will be able to uh, release it soon. Obviously, COVID has put dents in our original um, plan for distribution. Okay. But um, I would say, ideally, it would be... December, January. Okay. Um, cool. Actually, sooner than you would think. But yeah, sure. 
obviously we had to push things back because of COVID. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, trying to do this, I, I, this, I'm going to tell you this from my heart, this doing this documentary was an absolute pipe dream. I talked it over with a couple friends, Ginger Tyson and Pat Elward, who were in the movie industry and said, yeah, it's a good story, Kathy, you should do it. I have never done a documentary. I have never done anything like this before in my whole life, never. And, and I just jumped in with both feet and started taking interviews and filming people. So we kept getting closer and closer to a finished product. We were in January of this year, we had a rough cut and we were showed it to people to get some advice. And we thought we were going to be done like in spring, maybe, or early, early summer this year. And then all this madness hit. And this has just been so hard to stay focused, to, to, to really even think that a story like this matters at this time in our nation's history with the COVID, with politics being crazy and just and, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement coming up as well. I mean, it's just right. like, wow, how does this story even compete with more those more important themes? Right. right. But, <laughs> you know, we're going to carry on. We're going to finish it. And then we'll just we'll see what happens with it. Yeah. And and you're absolutely right. And and obviously those other things, bit large issues that our civilization, our society and our communities are dealing with usurp that. But something to be said about bringing a little happiness through memories is, is doing stuff like this. And that's kind of what pushes me to, to keep on, on keeping on, you know what I mean? So yeah, uh, me I'm too. Just, yeah. I'm happy you decided to, to be on the show tonight. And this is, this is a, an, an awesome thing. And I hope you guys get this out because uh, you know, it looks to me like people are excited about it. We've got some great people uh, tuning in. Uh, Good. Hey, uh, Mike, I was going to suggest you should yep. go to uh, the Friends of the Drumstick group because okay, there's a lot more. Some of the pictures there are a lot more of the bands and yeah, the flyers and all of that stuff, too. Cool. But, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Sharonda and I have been working hard on this. We think we've we put something together that will be uh, that'll be mo be moving and. And because the story of the drumstick is, is a bittersweet story for our family. Yeah. It's kind of funny because uh, Kathy, when Kathy was pitching it to me, she says, I got all these interviews. I guess I have to shoot more interviews. What can I do with this? <laughs> Basically, um, yeah. yeah. It's like that's how it started. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this it's this American story of a mom and pop restaurant that makes it big in the rock and roll world, so to speak. But then through, you know, no, no fault of their own tragedy strikes and the thing just disappears and is basically wiped off the face of the earth when the drumstick building got destroyed for that make room for the for the fast food so, restaurant. That was, so you know, that was talk it. a little bit talk a little bit about that. And I know it was kind of coupled with, um, well, talk about the timeline. Cause I'm not totally sure about the timeline of your brother's passing and then, uh, how the landlord of the building decided to sell to McDonald's. Can you kind of talk about that timeline? I can a little bit. I mean, okay. I have to, I have to preface everything I say by the fact that I'm part of the family. I was there in the beginning, but I was not there. I was doing something else. I was in Omaha at the end. Okay. Um, so I don't really have all of the exact details and timelines, okay. but the, 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 the gist of the story of the documentary is kind of the rise and the fall of the drumstick. And part of the rise we've already discussed just out of a whim, we started booking bands and Tim took it over and, he had this keen sense for music and this gregarious personality and things just started rocking. But some nights they weren't rocking, you know, it just depended. You, we usually got these bands 
during the week, you know, if it's a good popular band, they were probably going somewhere else for the weekend, but they would play the drumstick during the week. So sometimes the crowd would be good. Sometimes the crowd wouldn't be good. But bottom line was it was it was a rocking place. And that's where all these memories of that were built. That's where this community of friends of the drumstick comes from, from those yeah. times. But in about 1985, Tim, who liked to party, had uh, an episode where he hurt his throat. He and he was a hemophiliac. And for those of you who don't know what hemophilia is, it's a blood disorder where your your blood doesn't clot and you bleed. Anytime you get an injury, you'll either get a really horrible bruise where your the blood's coming in underneath your skin or it just will, you'll cut open and it won't stop bleeding. So Tim was a hemophiliac, was born that way. It's a genetic disorder. He got sick. His He was bleeding internally from his throat, had to go into the hospital, mm-hmm. did blood transfusions. And at that time, there was something else. There was another virus running around the world and it was called HIV. Mm-hmm. They did not know that HIV was in the blood supply. And when Tim got those uh, intravenous transfusions, he was given uh, HIV through those blood transfusions. And when he found out about that, that was kind of when the drumstick started to, to, that was the fall of the drumstick because I don't know, it, it took the wind out of his sails it threw him, uh, it threw all of us. And, you know, bottom line was the, he lost interest and, um, uh, there was no one there to keep it going. And the drinking age had been raised. So the group of people that were coming were, was getting smaller and, and they just decided not to do it anymore. Wow. Now, somewhere wow. in that grand scheme of things, the landlord I, and I have heard two different versions of this story that the landlord told my family that they, he was selling the property or, and I've heard that we decided not to do it anymore. And then the land, and then the landlord sold the property because he didn't, he may not have sold it out from under, uh, from under the business is what I'm saying. I have to get some clarification on that from somebody. And I just haven't taken the time to do that yet. But regardless, the property got sold, the business closed. They had a a band perform on July 31st, 1987, and August 1st, 1987 was the auction. And that was the end. Wow. Wow. Okay. So it just kind of, it was, it was a kind of a culmination of of a few different things. Yeah. But I mean, you know, if Tim, Tim, my brother, Tim was the, he was the heart and soul of the whole thing. And Sharonda, out of those interviews you've li- you've listened to, she's heard all the interviews. She knows all the footage. You know, he was. He was the heart and soul of that. And when he lost that energy for it, it just, there was, no one could replace him in that. And so it all coincided together to make it be the end. Wow. Yeah, he- um, that's kind of the way we structured, decided to structure the documentary. It's um, ultimately it is it is a story about the Low Myers in general, but Tim was the driving force of turning the restaurant into you know this rock and roll club. And then once he got sick, uh, things started to fall apart because he was the glue that held it together. Mm-hmm. So um, and then he uh, passed away in 1998. Is that right, Kathy? Yes, he did. So um, in a way, we we kind of personified the drumstick with Tim's story. And that's the story we decided to tell um, about the drumstick was that he, you know, Tim was this guy that everybody, everybody liked him. Everybody adored him. He was definitely of that rock and roll spirit. Um, But then it also had to come to an end, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So officially the club closed in 19, was it 89? No, August 1st, 1987. 87. That's right. Okay. So, okay. Got you. Got you. So, so Tim actually lived 
you know, uh, he, he lived with, with the disease for quite a while. Yes, oh, he yeah, did. He lived, for, he, lived long, he lived fairly long for a person who was diagnosed in the 80s, yeah. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. I mean, he... <laughs> Tim... Tim was a always just a survivor and a fighter. And we all assumed that when he survived the throat rupture that he would be fine because Tim was that kind of guy. He survived stuff. He would get into some, you know, he was no angel. Don't let me even begin to paint a story that sounds like makes him sound like a saint or an angel. Cause he wasn't. <laughs> and we still loved him, but he always landed on his feet. So that's why the, the AIDS, the, the HIV diagnosis was just devastating because we found out he didn't land on his feet that time after all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for so and he years. lived a good long time, 11 more years, roughly. Yeah. Wow. Which was a lot longer than folks who were getting, who had HIV and then manifesting AIDS that he lived a lot longer than a lot of them, a lot of folks. And he lived a lot longer than anyone expected him to at the time. Wow. Yeah, well, it is. It's, 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 it's and that's was. the story of the documentary. It's this, wow, you hate yeah. to see the drumstick go and you hate to see it go in such a way, but you know, that's part of why it's so such an incredible story. Yeah. Wow. What do you think, Sharonda? It is. It's a little bit of a downer. A little bit of a downer I will admit. Well, it's a um, beginning, middle, and an end, though. It's it's got a beautiful rainbow. Uh, how every story takes place, you know. But the the thing that we try to that we're going to try to leave people with is this remembrance. Well, that's just of, it. it's not a downer of, at all. <laughs> yeah, and and the fact that all of this happened in Little O Lincoln, Nebraska, in the 1980s, it helped plant the seeds of this incredible music scene that we have in Lincoln. True. Absolutely. And it wasn't just the drumstick. I know that because gosh, you know, let's give sing praises to the zoo bar that's been there even longer. Mm -hmm. um, and all the incredible acts that place brings through. Yeah. But I, you know, we, I would just like to make sure that people in Lincoln know it happened. They know <laughs> that this little bit of magic happened and that on, on those shoulders, so to speak, some of the really cool music venues we have today in Lincoln, you know, they had, they had something to build from because of the drumstick. <laughs> that's, that's the beauty. That's the ending. <laughs> that really is. I mean, that's like, that to me is, uh, you know, solidifying the, the remembrance is fantastic. Beautiful. And people, like I said, they still talk about it. They still have memories of, you know, um, it's talking to Dave boy and, you know, and about some of this stuff, it sounds like he lived there, you know, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> many, so many people, so many yeah. people called, so many people called it their home, you know, I mean, this was, yeah, the place well, was. it, you could do that because it served food. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They bear, yeah, for two hours, you it have to go like, somewhere else. It was like, you know, for some of the artists that we interviewed, it was like uh, they're, they're a little home away from home because they had a kitchen. You know, when there's a party, everybody hangs out in the kitchen, right? The kitchen yeah. always seems to be the heart of anybody's home. Well, the drumstick had a kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, And it yeah. became the heart, I think, of that place, even though it was rock and roll. But you'd also got nourishment there, not just fun, not just spiritual, you know, rock and roll fun nourishment. You got actual food nourishment and you could hang out there and have a cup of coffee in the morning and just, you know, maybe you had a rough night and people would come in, you know, like Jason, right? Sharonda Jason from Jason and the Scorchers said, we ate there for breakfast we ate there for lunch. We'd <laughs> hang out there and fix our instruments till the show came on. And then we'd have a dinner right before the show. We just hung out there the whole day long. Beautiful. I have to admit, he, they were my favorite band because um, of just 
how much broke artists that they had, like the stories were just broke artists. Like he had two different shoes and they had like this rundown vehicle that they sort of rode in on fumes. It's a leaking <laughs> <on>. <laughs> they were really looking forward to that chicken because like that was all they were going to eat besides like what white bread sandwiches or something. White so, bread and bologna. <laughs> um, yeah, that that was a very um, we had to dedicate some time definitely to uh, Jason and the Scorchers because that that was that was that was fun. Yeah, I've heard Absolutely. about this band from Omaha called the Verandas. This was a favorite of many people that played the drumstick quite often. They were from. Omaha, I think they were the ones. If I'm not mistaken, the Verandas were the ones that played the last gig. Oh, is that right? Oh, the wow. July 31st gig. They were the last oh, wow. ones to play the drumstick. I'll be darned. That's interesting. Very, very cool stuff. And, and you know, so and I anyway. urge, yeah, I urge people to get on the website. Um, remember the drumstick.com for the list of bands, right? You got the full list up there. Yeah, we do have the full list. Don't we Kathy? It's, it's, it's on the, it's on the website. Definitely. Okay. It's on the, the website and we're going to try. We're going to try to have it run somewhere at the end in the credits where, so people can just, I mean, I did the research to compile this list because, you know, let's be honest, it's the 1980s. The, people don't have cameras in their pockets or video cameras in their pockets. Right. So everything that happened there, none of it got recorded or transcribed into a journal or any, any kind of written documentation. So basically, I went through, you know, this Friends of the Drumstick Facebook group I went through all those flyers that people posted and I just started writing down names of every every single name of a band I could find any documentation for. And then I went and searched all the Lincoln Journal archives and started getting bands from them too. Oh, and good. so yeah. the, the, the list we have is about as good as we can get it. But I'm still getting people telling me, I played there and I'm looking at the list going, don't have your name. <laughs> Hey, what's, what's your band? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Here's a band called REM that played there Saturday, May 28th. Look yeah, a, a, a little are. band. <laughs> a little band people might have heard of. Yeah, yeah oh, no, might be losing But I mean, I, I, I wrote, you know, Albert Collins played there. Luther Allison played there. Jay McShan, McShan played there. Fishbone played there. 10,000 mm -hmm. Maniacs played there. Cowboy oh, wow. Junkies played there. Uh, you said The Descendants, yeah. The Violent Femmes, Soul Asylum, X, Black Flag played there. Uh, True Believers played there. Dwight Yoakam played there. <laughs> yeah. Georgia Satellites, Nick Lowe, Modern English, The Professionals. I mean, these are just some I quick wrote down real fast so that I could just try to wow the audience with this list. Husker do played there. That yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an yeah. incredible list. It really is. And it's funny because most of them, you know, most of what we were hearing in the documentary were people who were kind of in a punk phase, but I don't think the drumstick would classify like based on the bands. Yeah. Like a good portion of them are punk. But I think it was just eclectic enough that it just spoke to a lot of people, like musically. Just if you like, if you're a fan of music, you would have loved the drumstick, regardless of whether or not you were a quote punk fan or not. Right, right. Well, it just looks it like played, an incredible place to see a show. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. It basically mm -hmm. played anything that Tim thought was interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's the vibe I got in the documentary too. Yeah. Whatever Tim thought was good, that's what he played. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Jason from Jason and the Scorchers, he said, he asked me, gosh, where do you think Tim got that? I mean, he just, because he said he could have worked for a record label. He had such instincts on, on some of the music. And, um, you know, without really knowing or because no, he, and I asked people when we interviewed, did you ever talk to Tim about this? Did you ever ask him what his thought processes were or what his, what the future was going to be or what he thought the future should be? And they said, no, Tim was just like a, 
he was a guy who just lived in the moment. He didn't really yeah. talk about yeah. that stuff. He just had an ear for music. Yeah. And, you know, when he, we were little kids, you know, this is like a, this will be nostalgia 101 for all the baby boomers that might be listening. When we were little kids, he was child number six. I was child number seven. My little brother, Greg, was child number eight. We were the tail end, the caboose of the family. My dad had always had restaurants and they used to have jukebox, jukeboxes, right, in restaurants. And they played those little 45s. And the jukebox man, when he would come in and clear out the records and put in fresh ones, he would give all those 45s to my dad, those old ones. Oh. So he would give them to us and we had like a little record player and we would just stack them like four or five inches high <laughs> just until the, the record player arm wouldn't clear the stack. And we just played those 45s over and over and over. And then we'd flip the whole stack over and play those. But we were listening to all the top 50 songs of any time period. So I don't know. I keep thinking maybe some of that trained Tim's ear. Sure. Oh, had no doubt. I would imagine that it formed his musical ear early on. No, no question. Yeah. It's just really something going through these old, but here's Nick Lowe and his cowboy outfit. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Meat puppets. Absolutely incredible. Here's the Red Hot Chili Peppers, October 19th. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's, I mean, those, that's, that's the only documentation that's really left of the place. And I wanted to thank everybody who's in that Friends of the Drumstick because, yeah, they, they are the ones that really preserved all this. And it's their memories that really inspired me to make this documentary. Beautiful. Well, we urge people to, uh, you know, there is some people commenting in. Um, uh, Good. You know, they're saying that, you know, Good. Drumstick and, and Dirt Cheap were essential to Lincoln's development. Dirt Cheap was a record store, obviously, that Lincoln had. Um, that, of course, I hear all about. Uh, you know, that's where everybody bought their new music. And, and Oh, yeah. Refined. Let's be clear. We are almost done with the documentary, so it will be coming out soon. We're almost done. They're almost done, yes. folks. Yeah, yes. We, we're, we're, we're we're yeah. The great we Nils Erickson. We are. Here. Nils we're Erickson in the. Program. I mean, I can't see any of these comments. Can you guys see the comments? I can't see them. Uh, I can see I, Yeah, if you're if you have another window open, you can see the people commenting in people on commenting Facebook. In on yeah. Facebook. Oh, so. sorry. Well, I don't, I can't see them, but we're, we're ready to go into post-production, which no, we're means we're ready. I'm just going to clarify. We are in post-production. We're almost done with post-production. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what we're ready to do, <laughs> what we're ready to do is go to the sound editing and uh, the colorizing to make it look pretty on the screen and to make nice. it sound as best as we can make it sound. Cool. Yeah. We're at the and final finishing stages. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's, oh my gosh, it's just been a labor of love. That's all I can tell you. And for anyone who's thinking about making a documentary and has never done it before, you better talk to me first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's a lot of work. You can absolutely, absolutely you can do it, but you better talk to me first just so you know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> Yeah, Kathy, you came to me early on asking about, you know, what it takes. And I I, I told you then it was it's going to take a lot of work for sure. Oh, <laughs> it's, you did. It takes a lot of work. But uh, I'm went, happy for you guys. I'm really proud how far you guys came. It's it's coming together. And pe so uh, I got to read this one comment from Fred Robertson. This is uh, somewhat funny. One show, he says, I saw the drumstick was Joe King Sarasco, backed up by Charlie Burton and Rock Therapy. My pregnant wife drove three crazy drunks, myself and two buddies, to the show in the summer of 1982. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Pregnant wife. I can oh see her my face. Gosh. I can see That's her actually face. one of the themes of the drumstick was that, you know, it was like it created this little, this little pocket in Lincoln, Nebraska, where 
everybody knew your name kind of a thing, you know, even though you really didn't know everybody's name, it was a community of music lovers. And, you know, uh, I have had several people tell me that they met their spouses there, Mm -hmm. um, that maybe they lost their virginity there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of it, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, just all sorts of crazy stuff. And, you know, my brother Tim was, he was a pretty easygoing guy. If anyone out there listening or watching is friends of our family from when we were kids growing up, they know exactly what I'm talking about. We were pretty, you know, it's basically, you know, pretty much you can do what you want, kids, but don't ever get caught. Back then it was probably harder to get caught, for sure. Oh, yeah, but it was, you know, it wasn't harder, it was, but the consequences were probably worse if you got caught back then. That might have been an incentive as well. But basically, you know, we I've had so many people say, I really wasn't old enough to get in, but I climbed the back fence where the beer garden was and, and snuck in the side door. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's it makes for a, you know, these memories are are your formative years, so to speak. And they're your coming of age memories. And I think that's part of why remember the drumstick is so important to so many people still. Right. And that's just the people who attended it. Then there's the stories of the musicians, which is another whole interview, basically. Yeah. Um, That's another whole uh, broadcast. We didn't mention that the the replacements played there. Um, Oh yeah, they did. On that last poster is coming back. I'm not sure what Fred Robertson means by that, but the replacements I've seen uh, have played there. Is there any story? Oh, sure they're coming back. They're coming back to the drumstick. Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. And I swear, I tried to get some of these big bands to talk to me, but you know, just didn't happen. He said they were notorious for the wildness in the early '80s. The replacements. Yeah, I've heard that too. <laughs> and then Jim Jones, uh, the great Jim Jones, um, local musician uh, extraordinaire. Uh, archival history guy uh tim was always so supportive of local bands he let anyone with an instrument play on a weeknight and really helped foster the local scene that's absolutely true we should mention that he also let minors in (laughs) that's great (laughs) well Um, they were they were you know it it, it's it, something it to be was, said because there was probably no all ages shows back then, and all ages shows were so important during my growing up. And when Knickerbockers was happening and the Culture Center was happening, this was kind of like in the you know uh, late nineties. Um, this was huge for me, and there was a there was an all ages scene, and that was enormous for developing yes. local music. Enormous. But the the drumstick when it started though when the liquor license started uh, which was probably you know 79 1979 the drinking age was 19 so okay, all sure. ages shows weren't as critical then because you could get in at mm-hmm. 19 and of course there are some people who push it and get fake IDs and you could at 18 you could look 19 <laughs> At 18, you don't necessarily look 21, let's put it that way. But because of that drinking age being 19, I think, yeah, there was was probably some fluidity there. And Jim says uh, most of the people who wanted to see new bands were under 20, so... Oh yes. yeah, we got that impression too with the interviews that pretty much a lot of people were, quote, illegally in the band. Sure, <laughs> I mean, sure, in the... Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, some of the band members were in their teens, like 16, 17. And then, of course, their friends would want to see them play. So there was that element to it as well. But, yeah, I mean, it it worked out for the – I mean, I know I'm sure some people would listen to this and go, well, that was just breaking the law. It's like, Mm. well, yeah, but, you know – that's great. Life is <laughs> life is for the living. Let's put it that way. And sometimes people do push the envelope a little bit. That's right. And that That's doesn't right. necessarily make it a bad thing. Some what they're the gonna people, do about it now? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the people the that, that, that limitations did, are over. 
transformative days for many rock and rollers. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Um, and I do, I want to encourage people if I might interrupt you just for a second, sure. which I've probably been doing all night and I apologize. No, you're fine. But um, <laughs> I really encourage people to go to remember the drumstick.com because there's a lot of information on the Facebook groups, but I am going to, as soon as this documentary is done, I am transitioning all of my efforts to the website. And I want people to put their stories in there, to upload their pictures there, because I'm going to start working on doing some historical research on the bands that played there. I have a book called by Bart Becker called Till the Cows Come Home. I know that book. And it's basically, he wrote, I don't know what the copyright date is on it, but he wrote a book about all the bands that were playing through Lincoln and Nebraska. You probably know about it. Don't you, Mike, that book? I, I know about it. Um, and I'm, I'm in the works of, of repressing it. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. But I'm going to try to, I've gotten permission from Bart Becker to put some of those, those little blurbs that he wrote about these different bands, local bands Whoa. to put those and attach them to the band name if they were in Lincoln. So I'm going to start doing that as well as, um, you know, for the bigger names, I will have links to their official websites and whatnot so that you can kind of trace these bands that played the drumstick. And that's going to all happen on the website. So the more stories and remembrances you can put on there, the better. Remember the drumstick.com, one big long word. That is awesome. And, um, yeah, that book is legendary, you know, and there was only, I, I believe there was 500 printed and, and many of them fell apart because the binding was so terrible. The glue yeah. that the, that the press maker was using, it wasn't great. So the people that had them rebound, those are probably still in existence. I have one copy that some, somebody gave to me and then I came across another copy that was in, in pieces. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's an incredible book. Jim Jacoby, Jim Jacoby, the, the artist who painted the picture and who was also the um, the guy who formed the, the crap detectors. Yeah. He gave me his copy or loaned me his copy. So oh, I, and mine and that copy is falling apart. The binding fell apart. Oh, that's cool. Here's here's the uh, the cover of that. If you can see it. Um, I believe it was 84 that, that it was printed. But that Could is be. a very, very cool cover. Um, that's the cover. And I just heard uh, Bruce Springsteen bought a copy for an extremely high amount. Uh, wow. He, he wrote, he wrote uh, the album called Nebraska, and he wanted to get a copy of the book. And, he, and I heard cool. he paid plentiful for it. But nice. Um, well, I hope it was yeah, one that was still yeah, stuck together. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You got to give the boss a, at least a, a book, uh, you know, a good book well, there. Do it. I mean, have we talked enough about the documentary? Is there any other questions you have about it or? Well, I mean, I think it's awesome. A lot of people, uh, I think you, you talked great about it. I think that um, obviously people are chomping at the bit to see it. Uh, the interviews are obviously where the magic is going to happen there. Um, I think some of the, the stories are, are wanting to be heard. And, um, I think it's fantastic. I, you know, uh, I'm, as far as funding goes, is there a place, it looks like you can donate on the website. Yes, I know, I yes. know you're not quite to your goal of 30,000. So let's help out the most we can. If you, if you can donate to this and afford to donate to the hall of fame, that's awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would like to say something extremely cool and important if I could. Yeah. Um, yeah. My father and I would like to induct tonight the dr the drumstick into the Hall of Fame. Ooh, are you so serious? Congrat so congratulations. Oh, oh my gosh, what does that mean? mean? <laughs> what does that well, mean? That, that means that that means that you kick ass. That that and that means that you are your family are legends and uh Low lives are history. And uh, your brother your brother your brother will forever be remembered in Nebraska history and hopefully you will. Oh as well. my god, thank you, Mike. That's we gotta so have a big good. party. We gotta have a party for this. <laughs> we will have a party. I will promise you that we will have a party and we will officially I mean you're officially in 
conducted now. But I, I also want to say that that when we when we do have a are able to come together and and hug and whatever you know kiss each other or whatever we do when we see each other, uh, we're going to have uh, an, a, a personal physical induction happen. And um, uh, how exciting! So we, so, well, you 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 know I keep hearing about this. My father keeps hearing about it. It's obviously a piece of Nebraska rock history that needs to be solidified in the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame. And as of tonight, you are now an inductee. So congratulations. Oh my God. That is incredible. Tim, did you hear that, Tim? <laughs> that's incredible. That, that's incredible. That's incredible. I'm, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you to absolutely. you and your father. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, I, I'm speechless. And that doesn't happen to me very often. Well, <laughs> Dad's tuning in right now, and uh, you know his heart has been in Nebraska music since day one. And my my grandmother was music was a music teacher for, geez, seventy plus years it seemed. And uh, you know Nebraska history to me is everything. And when I hear a story like this, and your passion behind it, and Sharonda's passion behind it, and your brother's passion behind it, that is the magic that we're after. And you and you created that. It's a piece of Nebraska history now. It's well, fantastic. let me say one more thing about this then. This is, okay, to do this documentary, I formed a foundation called Tim Lohmeyer and Friends of the Drumstick Foundation. And that, of course, was to help me, you know, raise money for the for the making of the documentary. But also uh, the goal was to uh, raise money to continue promoting live music affordably, you know, cause that was the thing, the drumstick, you could afford to go there and it's all kind of gone. A lot of it's gone rock, rock concert style again with big arenas and stuff like that. But we want to make it easy to get to uh, affordable you know, and open to people from all walks of life and all steps of culture here in, in Nebraska. So there's that piece of the foundation but we have, as a family, we have a bunch of artifacts still from the drumstick. So oh, cool. someday I am hoping that we can find a home for some yeah. of these artifacts. Well, and that's a, a museum fantastic. would be, a Hall yeah, of Fame yeah. museum would be a really cool place to put it. We are, we are in the works about having a physical location here in Lincoln, Nebraska, because my father's got an incredible amount of physical items and uh, posters over the years that have been donated. And tons of people have donated some really incredible pieces of iconic things. Um, so absolutely, by all means, uh, I hope to raise the, the, the money that we need to have a physical location. And that, that would be fantastic to have in Lincoln, Nebraska, for sure. The capital may, may I answer your father's question, if you don't mind, about how sure. the documentary is going to be marketed? Yep. Okay. So um, originally, like we said, we were going to showcase it um, in a theatrical release in Lincoln because that was near and dear to Kathy's heart that it will be shown in Lincoln first. Um, like, like we've been saying, unfortunately, COVID has put kind of a wrench in that. So okay. we'll have we're, we are shopping around our other options. We still are planning on marketing it in Lincoln first. We're still we're talking about doing festival runs for the documentary, um, and we mostly wanted to hit up places that also had music histories. Um, so like New Orleans, Nashville, um, Memphis, places like that, St. Louis, Austin, um, yeah, places, cities that have. Um, storied music histories as well. That's kind of where we wanted to make sure that we're hitting it up. And then we also wanted to uh, use it as an educational tool um, because it is, we do consider it kind of a historical text of Lincoln. Okay. So um, that's kind of the way that we were going to be marketing it. And we, like I said, we, we're we still kind of figuring that out now because of COVID. Uh, sure. The whole film industry is figuring out how to market things that yes. have been in the works. So uh, we're not alone in that, but that's definitely um, what we're doing. Very definitely. Cool. That's awesome. I mean, you know, my dream was to have a, a big premiere here in Lincoln and, you know, do our own little red carpet thing. And it's just, I just don't know if it's realistic anymore. Who knows what's going to happen in the next 12 months. I think anything's we're realistic. Gonna do something. It's probably okay to wait. You know, I mean, there's no, there's no sense in rushing 
rushing it, obviously be safe and you can do, I think, I think we'll be out of this sooner than people think. So hopefully. Yeah. And then well, there's a lot of virtual, there's a lot of virtual um, venues that are happening now and streaming. So we're yeah. probably going to be revisiting those and, and that mostly, most likely would be how people will view remember nice. the drumstick is through a streaming option. Nice. Okay. Well, that's exciting. You guys, I think it's to make a documentary film is not easy. I've, mm -hmm. I've, done it and it's not easy and i tell you it's a it's a huge huge thing it's a big feat so congratulations on that and um let wow. may i say one more thing too Absolutely. Um, any money that this thing makes if it makes any money i mean the goal was never to really do this to be a money churner but you know if people watch it and we make a little money off it all that money's going to go into the TL and Friends of the Drumstick Foundation. So very cool. I just want to, I want to make sure people understand that that we really, as much as Tim gave to the community during his time when he was alive, and in, in terms of the drumstick, I think if there's anything we can do to with this foundation, if there's anything we can do to continue that here in Lincoln and and Nebraska in particular, we're going to keep we'll keep doing it. So long as uh, we have the funding for it. That's great. That is awesome. And um, as you know, as we, as we go forward with events, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I, I love putting mm -hmm. on events and for good causes. So please let me know. Um, yeah. We should do like a big uh, fundraiser for, for the performing arts hall of fame and yeah. the drumstick. I'm, uh, I'm all about it. I'm all about it. We, <laughs> we did, we did it. We did a chicken you know, I love, uh, I, I shot a movie at Lee's chicken in college, funny enough. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it was about Mormons and chickens. Uh, it was a script, oh my gosh. It was a script, a script I wrote, uh, um, called Hobbitsville, which Hobbitsville is a great, uh, Nebraska history thing too. It's like a haunted, ha supposed haunted house up, up here in near South at neighborhood. But I called the movie. Oh, I've heard of that. I've called it, I called it Hobbitsville cause I was inspired by that, but it's about Mormons and chickens. And we shot the film at Lee's chicken. And, uh, and so then you had me play there and it was in the same room. So I had back like, uh, you know, back flashes from, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> so it was great, right. great to yeah, be a part yeah. of that. Uh, and, but I want to, I want to do whatever I can to raise some money for this awesome project. I just love yeah. these historic archival well, things. So I can't thank you enough, Mike, cause you have been very, I mean, you helped video some of the footage of yeah. interview footage. You helped with that you've helped with this. You've, helped play at a fundraiser you've been you've been hey, a really just, awesome awesome support is, structure you're welcome and this is just getting good stuff out to the people and, and remembering how cool nebraska is right i mean this is absolutely like, this yeah. is nebraska uh, through and yeah through, so. yeah we are cool i mean <laughs> i mean cool is in here that's right that's right that's right that's and awesome. yeah we're I mean, it's not a real sexy place to be from, but <laughs> you don't co wait, wait, we don't coast. Is that what the no the, coast. the no coasters? Uh, yeah, the no yeah. coast derby girls. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, you know, we have our own we have our own sense of cool, and I think There's that no people who see this documentary are going to understand that. Yeah you don't have to be in LA. You don't have to be in New York. You don't have to be in Austin to have uh, incredible access to incredible life changing music and entertainment. Right. That's true. I think some yeah. of the greatest, some of the greatest uh, music is happening right here in the Midwest. And I think you got wholesome people doing wholesome things and, that goes a long way with a lot of people, man. I tell you, mm -hmm. your brother's yeah. remembered by a lot of people. A lot of people. Oh my gosh. That's I can't still can't believe you put him in the your hall of fame. I just think yeah, that's so cool. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. I think I think what you guys did from a chicken joint to a rock <laughs> venue to now this historic, <laughs> legendary Nebraska club. I think it's just uh, it's a it's a beautiful story, man. It, it really is. It just and I hope people you know, uh, watch the documentary and just really cherish those memories. It sounds like people are already um, doing that, but, you know, cherishing memories of that place. But I think now it's solidified. And and there's only so much you can put in a 60 minute documentary. There are so many more stories. 
there was, I have minutes and minutes and hours of footage of people telling stories and I can only use, right, Sharonda, we can only use like little bits here and little bits there. So, yep, that, that was the conversation that we had was that we had to keep it tight under 60 minutes. So, yeah. I mean, it's like I said, if people would put their written stories on that website, the remember the drumstick.com website. Yeah. It would just, it just flushes. It just, this documentary is not going to do the drumstick justice. I'll tell you that right now. People, <laughs> I'm sure we're going to go, oh my gosh, she missed this. She missed that. She didn't talk about this. She didn't talk about that. That's why we have to continue grabbing these stories from everywhere they come from. Either the musicians that played there or the pe- kids who snuck in there. Or just the the people that work there. I mean, we have so many people in Lincoln still that were just cooks and waitresses there before it ever became a a, a rock club, and they have stories about it because oh, it, wow. it. I don't know. I know that there are places like this still out there, but this this one was ours, and there hasn't been an, another one like it since. I'm getting oh, choked up. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love, I love what you're saying. Can, can I, uh, can we take a second and invite Jim Jones in to talk? Oh yeah. 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 Let's let's, let's have have a little party. This is a fellow I tried to get an interview with. Jim Uh, Jones. Let's let's see if he's around here. He's a patron and oh yeah, he's got some great stories. Is that Jimmy? Jim Jones? Yeah. If he's there. there. We're not seeing him. So maybe his internet connection is goofed, but, uh, Oh, uh, we'll see. Maybe not. Maybe we'll give it a second. Maybe he logged in and logged out. But uh, yeah, so many people, so many people are, are have incredible, you know, Jim, Jim posts some really fantastic posters and, and has some uh, really fun knowledge about those days. Um, it'd be cool. Oh my gosh. Around. I'm trying to think, I, you know, I, I could tell a lot of stories, but I don't want to steal the thunder from the documentary itself. So sure. I'm kind yeah, of, of I'm kind of uh, limited in what I can talk about. Yeah. But um, just in general, the the sense of what we've been getting from the interviews is that if you were someone coming to a show at the Drumstick, and you can you can chime in here, Sharonda, you never knew what you were gonna have, what was gonna happen that night. <laughs> you know, you might come to the door and. You know, whoever was taking the door might, you know, take a dislike to whatever you had on written on your T-shirt or because, you know, this is a family run business. So these are characters in the family that can't get fired for their behavior. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah, there's no limitation. So, So they can pretty much do whatever they want. And, you know, you might be uh an attractive person and they'll let you in just because you're attractive looking, or you might get charged this amount of money, but the person behind you gets charged something else. <laughs> so right. you, you walk in the place and it might be packed or it might be empty, but it, you never knew when you were, you were going to hear some incredible music. I will tell this one story from the documentary that um, Kent Walgamont told. And he said, uh, you know, there were lots of times that these bands would come through and there'd only be about 20 people in the place. And he tells the story of uh, the bongos that came through and there were only about 20 people in the place. He said, but boy, did we have a good time. Oh my <laughs> so awesome. sometimes when there weren't a lot of people, Tim would just start partying with the people who did come. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. I also got the impression that um, even though it's not in the documentary, maybe it's hinted a little bit, that um, because of the very ad hoc way of charging people, whatever, um, that might be one of the reasons why the drumstick also closed. Sure. Because. um, Never never know. Well, uh, because people would say, oh, Tim would just let me in. You know, I couldn't pay this or, you know, Tim will let me in. He bought us all beer. He bought the whole club beer. Like, it's like, oh, okay, this doesn't. And then you get the interviews about the fan blades. Like, yeah, um, 
yeah, we couldn't afford this. We couldn't, like, yeah, because Tim was giving it all away. But yeah, that's great. <laughs> I think that was, I think that was what uh, Kent said. He goes, T wasn't like your typical club owner <laughs> where he yeah. locked things down and he knew exactly how it was going to be and he knew how much everybody was paying for everything and he was keeping track of everything. That wasn't Tim's style. It was more my sister's style. She was the the brawn trying to she was the person trying to make it financially viable but tim was less of less concerned about that and more concerned about getting good music to come through whether or not he thought he could pay the cover or whether or not he could pay their guarantee or not he would book them sure sure wow well taking risk on risks on young bands and then making buddies with those young bands and then when they're big they come back and play your club and they make you a lot of money you know yeah Dwight yeah. Yoakam's a big ticket. That's, uh, you know, they, an REM. He was then. I don't think he, I think he only played the drumstick that one time. Yeah. Cool. Well, Guitars and Cadillacs was down the street. He probably started playing there. I, I know he played there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Interesting to, stuff. That's great. There's, there were some other country stars that played, came through and played there. I can't think of their names. I have to get yeah. the t shirt. I have to get the list out. Right. With right, all right. the bands on it. Yeah. Well, um, Phil Phil Yoakum's brother's band, um, Brain Hammer. Uh -huh. uh, there's there's a great video online if you if you do a search for uh, that the, was... drum, the drumstick um, live music that they have a Brain Hammer show where they destroy a piano. <laughs> that was Phil Yoakum's brother. Uh, yeah, it's it's Phil's brother singing. Yeah, playing guitar or not singing but playing dang. guitar. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I believe he still plays in that that band. Yeah. So, Fun. Yeah, it's incredible. Phil, Phil, Phil Shoemaker, as many of you know from uh, Shit Hook, and uh, of course Charlie Burton's 800 band titles. Um, you know, uh, rock therapy cutouts, hiccups, uh, and the list goes on and on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Those guys play. The, well, the, I don't the, know. The, are you finding know. Jim? Well, he's. It, I'm not. I'm struggling to get him. He must be having some technical issues. So okay, that's okay. But, uh, um, one of the bands, I mean, the thing that also, like Sharonda said earlier, that the drumstick had just this, this, this diverse group of people coming through and playing music. Um, I don't know if everybody remembers uh, how popular reggae was in the 80s. Oh, my God. It was, shoot, it was just the thing that everybody wanted to listen to. And... And we had this band called Pat's Blue Rhythm Band. They were from Lawrence, Kansas. And they came and played through played in the drumstick. And I'm not kidding you. They had uh, a setup like you wouldn't believe. An organ, drums, uh, trombone, guitars, trumpet. Just, and they played this incredible reggae music oh, and wow, ska awesome. rhythms they were so good that place would fill up and there would be a, like it looked to me like there would be like 200 people dancing on that on the area right in front of the stage and people would get so hot and sweaty dancing that they would go outside with their beer bottles Oh, wow. And we would go, you cannot go outside. You've got to stop. You cannot go outside. You're going to get us in trouble. And so that was when we decided, oh, well, shoot, let's just build a beer garden. We had one of the first beer gardens in Lincoln because oh. that way people didn't go out the front door. They went out the back door into the beer garden where it was okay to take your beer bottle. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This guy looks like he's had a few. I'm not sure who he is, but it's a great photo. <laughs> it is. There's some really cool photos here. Oh my gosh. There are so many, so many good photos. Yeah. This is great. This that is was so Warner cool. Hodges. He's in the he's in the documentary. Oh, this guy back here? Right here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's Warner. Where if he was with the, in the uh Jason and the Scorchers. If... Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's Warner on the far left, Jason in the middle, and we've got both of those guys in the documentary. 
It looks like a huge room. I mean, it's got big size. I mean, the stage is decent size. That's great. It was. I mean, yeah. when the, when the drumstick first, when my dad first took over the drumstick, because it was a business that had already been started by another group of people, another family, and he just took it over. And I was maybe 10 or 11 when that happened. So I don't know any of the details about it. But it was half that that building that you have a picture of. It was half of that. And on the other side of it was a laundromat. And at some point in time, my dad decided to start staying open 24 hours. And that was when the drumstick just would get packed because there was nobody else inside the city limits that stayed open 24 hours. So we got all the bar crowd. When the bars let out, everyone would come to the drumstick and have, you know, something to eat to sober up or whatever. And um, that little... half of that building just got so busy. Dad asked the landlord if he could take over the, the, the laundromat side too. Oh, wow. And I guess they decided, sure. I, I don't know who ran the laundromat. Maybe the landlord did. He said, sure, you can have that side too. So that's when the drumstick took over the whole building. Wow. And wow. when it was running as strictly a restaurant at night in that midnight to 4 a.m. crowd, I don't know how many tables we had, but I think it sat well over a hundred people and it would turn two or three times in a night. And if for you have been in the restaurant business, you know, that's just cash and carry back. There weren't even any credit cards. Nobody used credit cards. It was cash and carry. And that place just, and that's why a lot of people still just remember it as a restaurant because it was so popular for the night crowd. That's incredible. That is incredible. That's pretty good to have that. And, you know, you've got probably four or five different things that the place does. It's just like very cool. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It was, you know, this is just, it's, it's just a good old Nebraska story. You know, my parents were from Sutton, Nebraska. They were in world war two. They lived during the depression. They made it. They survived both of those events. They moved to Lincoln and have, you know, a bunch of kids. And my dad was all, he learned how to cook in the army when he was a army man. That's where he learned to cook and he came out of the army and that's what he kept doing. So cool. So cool. I got a message from Jim and I'm not sure if it's going to work out to get him on here. Yeah, that's okay. His computer's cutting out. But, well, I just think this is a fantastic story. And I, and I so hope people uh, reach out and, and get on the website, rememberthedrumstick.com, and watch the documentary and really let it sink in on what the memories were and, and how it affected so many people. Um, so I think it's yeah. cool. I think it's awesome. <laughs> it's so fun. Well, thank you to all the audience out there. Thank you for listening in and watching and remembering yeah, the drumstick and yeah. you can get a hold of me through my email address. Remember the drumstick at gmail.com. I mean, if you can remember the phrase, remember the drumstick, you can pretty much find me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Sure. Tell people about our documentary that's coming up. What? I said, don't forget to tell people about, I'm saying to the audience, don't forget to oh, tell yeah. people about our documentary. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, I was gonna say honey, where you been? About. We've been talking about it all night. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do spread the word because there's yeah. still, I, I know that there's, you know, there's like maybe 1700 people in the Facebook group, but you know, people don't yeah. always pay attention to what's going on on Facebook as things get posted. And I have, um, over 700 people in the Facebook page. So those people I can reach out to at least to a certain extent and let them know what's going on. But I'm still running into people that say, we don't know anything about it. We didn't know you were doing this. We didn't know these that you're making this documentary. So I really am, yeah. I am beholden to all the people who do remember the drumstick to stay tuned to those two places and the website you know, let me know if you want to be on our mailing list. Just send me an email to uh, remember the drumstick at gmail.com and I'll put you on our mailing list because, you know, my dad always taught me that word of mouth is the greatest advertiser. 
That's true. So I really am depending on people to spread the word to musicians that played there, to um, people that were that snuck in, to people that you know were able to see many shows, to people that were only able to see one or two shows there. Spread the word. Thanks for saying that, Sharonda. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and and yes, by all means, um, keep spreading the link to people. Maybe they don't know that there's a private group. Maybe they don't know there's a Facebook page. But absolutely, um, keep spreading that word so you can get the word out about your groups and your newsletter. Absolutely, 100%. I think that's super cool. You're doing all the right things, guys. I think it's great. You know, I hope you get awesome distribution and hopefully somebody like Netflix or Hulu picks it up and you guys can rock and roll because you got some big names on there. It's very cool. It's very cool. So well, we'll just have to yeah. wait and see. One step at a time. Yeah, one step at a time. That's yeah, because right. then I gotta, you know, once we get all this stuff done, then I gotta go through all my paperwork and make sure I have all my permissions in the row. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I and I also urge people to donate to the Nebraska Music Hall of Fame. Um, there's the, to, to to put on these kinds of events to where we can remember, uh, you know, these great uh, venues and these great people and bands that that we had, uh, you know, a part of our history. And I I urge you to do that. So we are a 501c3, the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame. Uh, for a long time, the Hall of Fame was not a hall, uh, nonprofit, but my father and I got it back to that state. Thank goodness. Um, Good. You can donate at Nebraska Arts through uh, Venmo there too, and PayPal as well. So, and that's information's right on the screen. Even a five dollar donation helps us put on all kinds of cool events, and we can give out plaques and induct more people, like these beautiful people at the Drumstick. And, yes. um, so I tell you, I tell you, can't you wait to tell my family. Yeah, congratulations once again, and I just, I just want to send a big high five up to the clouds to your brother for just being a super cool cat and booking all kinds of great rock and roll bands. It's really made a huge yeah. difference in the Nebraska's yeah. history. So now hopefully he's immortalized in the hall of fame. And, uh, and um, I just say, congratulations. You're in the hall of fame. So. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you for having you us. Bet, you bet guys. And um, I'm going to turn on this awesome video I found uh, because I think it's very cool, and we're going to kind of go out with that. Um, so hold on, just I'm going to I'm going to share this. I'm going to share this the right way, though. Hold on, I got to share it with audio. So I'm going to say I'm going to say Thanks, my Rhonda. thank. Absolutely. So I'm going to say my thank yous to you guys. Um, let's see. I better do this right. We got to share it with audio. I'm going to move it over here so we can watch this sweet video from brain hammer. <laughs> All right, guys, much love to you. Have a happy weekend. Thank Thanks for you. tuning in everybody out there Thank and congratulations you. to the drumstick on, on their induction tonight in the Nebraska performing arts hall of fame. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Sharonda. And uh, please guys check out their website and support those great people in this awesome documentary. We'll talk to you guys real soon. Thanks for joining me tonight. Thank you. Okay. Good night.